This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. No matter what kind of football you like, I can pretty much guarantee that Week 10 has the kind of game that you want. You want a potential shootout between two very efficient passing offenses. We got Texans and Bengals. You want some good defensive matchups. Jags, 49ers, Ravens, and Browns both on the schedule as well. So it's a pretty fun slate no matter what flavor of football you want. We're going to break down all the top games for today, break down some betting options we like over at FanDuel Sportsbook by talking to Dr. Ed Feng and getting his read on the Lions this week at FanDuel Sportsbook. Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here as mentioned by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work at thepowerrank.com. Check him out on Twitter at the Power Rank Ed. Week number 10 is coming up right now. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Looking forward to another awesome week of NFL football and, and a lot of good games. Yeah, we got uh, the Bears and Panthers coming up tonight. Uh, Tom Vecchio broke down that game for us here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. And, you know, Ed, it may not be the most thrilling game, but nope. Nope. can I sell you on a double revenge game for Deontay Foreman and DJ Moore against their old team in the Panthers? You can try. I like <laughs> watching DJ Moore, whether it's a revenge game or not. So I'm not I'm not sure you're going to necessarily get me there. Well, Tyson Bajant and uh, Bryce Young, the... Uh, Will, some will say is a colossal failure so far, you know, the ones that don't realize the small sample size. Yeah. We're going to talk about exactly that small samples later on the show. Break down how to like analyze teams with new quarterbacks, whether it be the Titans with Will Levis, uh, Joshua Dobbs on a new team, Aiden O'Connell and the Raiders and more. And we'll break down the key games to bet this week in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Not only do we have the breakdown of the Thursday night game, uh, Tom Vecchio recording the Sunday night football preview early this week, too, because we have a couple holiday for tomorrow uh, veterans day coming up on saturday so uh sunday night football preview going up early we'll still have our prop episode with jj zacharyson up tomorrow here in the podcast that'll also be up on fanduel tv plus and the fanduel youtube page so make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts or watch your videos and also check out fanduel tv plus on amazon fire apple tv or roku devices or go to fanduel.com slash watch and log in with your fanduel account Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There is a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit FanDuel and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus in present and select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. Five dollar pregame money line wager required. Ten dollar first deposit required. Bonus issued is now withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash rg in colorado iowa michigan new jersey ohio pennsylvania illinois kentucky tennessee and virginia call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in arizona 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat connecticut 1-800-9 with it in indiana 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in kansas one 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 100-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Let's kick things off here by talking about those small sample size quarterbacks, Will Levis, Joshua Dobbs, Aiden O'Connell, and they've all at least had moderate, I would say, success with their teams in those small samples. So, Ed, I want to ask you broadly, how do you handle small sample quarterbacks when trying to project what their teams will do in the very near future? Very carefully, for sure. Uh, I've been looking at Aiden O'Connell's numbers this morning. It's pretty interesting. Uh 
you know, he had about a 39% success rate against the, the Chargers. NFL average is about 42%. Uh, that's not terrible. He had 46 attempts and then uh, 4.1 yards per pass attempt, which, which is terrible. But, you know, they probably broke him in with a lot of short passes. And then it hit me. I was like, oh, that's that's the crazy sack game, too, yeah. where he got sacked seven times. So, you know, given that he got sacked seven times, 39% isn't terrible uh it came in relief with brian hoyer against chicago 46 percent on 13 attempts 48 percent against the new york giants last week um i'm always cautious about small sample size obviously i don't want to say too much about aiden o'connell i would i guess i would say this is better than my expectations but definitely caution about the small sample size and i think you know like reasonable success rate small yards per pass attempt is what you would expect for a rookie quarterback, you know, kind of break him in gently. Uh, that's not at all what's going on with Will Levis. They're just airing it out. It's insane. Um, I actually track a uh, fraction of passes for a quarterback that go 10 air yards or more. The NFL average is 33%. Will Levis is at 44%. It's the highest in the NFL. And he's been successful with that. Three touchdowns of over 20 yards in that first game. And then seven, uh, no touchdowns, but seven uh, completed passes of 20 or more yards. When you look at the success rate, he's at 30%. That's worse than Zach Wilson, right? So that is definitely something I think is absolutely unsustainable, um, right? If it were a higher success rate and lower yard, you know, lower, less explosive plays, I think that's more sustainable. And I'm not saying that what Aiden O'Connell is doing necessarily is, but you would tend to believe that more. Um, but what Will Levis is doing is, uh, is not sustainable for anyone. No. And like with Levis, I think that the deep passes are actually like fun. So it's like, it's not going to be good. Like that success rate is low for a reason. And I don't think that's fluky. I think the low success rate is kind of what he was at Kentucky too, where it's like, he's going to take chances and if it hits, it hits. But it's also going to lead to some very bad things. So, like for you with your your uh, interception props, like probably going to be checking out what Levis at some point because they'll probably put the ball in danger pretty often. So for stuff like that, it's pretty interesting. And I think that honestly, when you look at the data you're looking at, Ed, I'm I'm pretty willing to trust small samples. I was listening to Rob Pizzola on your podcast, uh, the the Football Analytics Show, a couple weeks ago, talking about how like he is okay with small samples, more okay with small samples than a lot of people because he knows what data to look at. And when I think you're looking at success rate, looking at average depth of throw, like stuff like that, that's going to be stickier than like overall efficiency, like, you know, EPA metrics and such a small sample. So like, I think if we're okay looking at, if we know what metrics to look at, small samples are fine. We just have to know what those good metrics are. And I think things like success rates definitely do fit that criteria. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm always going to warn people to be cautious about small samples. I think um, that that's just kind of my nature. I want to see more. Um, you you did mention that, you know, this, this fraction of passes that go 10 or more air yards is going to tend to be more sticky in general. I agree with that. Uh, I would also bet my house that he's not going to end the season with 44% Probably of not. his passes uh, going that far. Uh, as well you also mentioned the bad ball rate his bad ball rate isn't like he's not actually putting the ball in danger too often uh he's actually right at nfl average about 11 i think he's let's see 11.9 percent and the nfl average over the past couple years has been 11.6 so not terrible i do think that's small sample size i would expect that to increase that is just a natural that just naturally happens when you're chucking the ball down the field. Not, right. not a surprise there. Uh, and, and your, uh, your probability for uh, an interception does go up. I actually, I mean, I actually haven't bet him either of the weeks yet. Uh, we'll see what happens this week. We'll see what kind of prices we get. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that that's a lot. We'll say more about Will Levis later. For sure. Okay. So we'll circle back to him later on and see what that says about week number 10. Let's start things off though with a pretty fun game in Cincinnati between the Texans and the Bengals. Where right now the Bengals are six and a half point favorites. Total in this game is 47. That has come down a point uh, with news that T Higgins kind of banged up. Uh, Jamar Chase practicing Thursday. T Higgins doesn't sound like he is, but I think the headliner here is on the opposing side. CJ Stroud and the Texans have played awesome football so far this year. So does that make you willing to consider taking the points in this matchup? 
I know. I kind of want nothing to do with this game. First, like, <laughs> I want to shout out Dr. Eric Eager, who actually talked about Houston preseason about being a team that he thought might be pretty good. So got to give a lot, of, a lot of props to Eric about that. I would have made this game 14 and a half points in the preseason. And I tend to not move very fast off my preseason priors in the NFL. And I'm making this eight and a half. So, you know, that's six points. That's a lot. And most of that is reflective of what this Houston team has done. They've been really good. CJ Stroud has been unbelievable. The defense has been, you know, not bad. I mean, they did give up a lot of points to Tampa Bay last week, but I would say that uh, that unit in general has actually been, uh, been, been pretty good uh, above what we would have expected this preseason. And then since the, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, my numbers from the current season are going to bring them down. I think a lot of people are just assuming they're back to five points better than NFL average and um, a Super Bowl contender. That's probably true. But uh, so I don't know. I mean, my my numbers do see value in this game since I'm making it Cincinnati by eight and a half. I'm not necessarily sure I want to bet it, um, you know, just just with all the movement that that's kind of happened during the season, I, I don't quite know what to make of it. Yeah. I think that's very fair. And honestly, like with this Bengals team, like they're a hard team to figure out, not just because of the injuries to chase and Higgins entering this week, but also because they've just been a weird team this entire year. And so do you trust the past four games with Burrow right. looking healthier? Do you kind of just go with that sample? Do you revert to last year and their numbers there? I don't really know. Um, I will say yeah. i I'm pretty high the Bengals. Like I did adjust their numbers up quite a bit as a result of what they've done, kind of looking primarily at the past four games. And that does make them a very good football team. I do still still show a bit of value in the Texans money line at uh well, not anymore, but when it was plus 270 earlier on this week, uh, I thought their win odds at 30.3%. So it is the ninth consecutive game. I have shown value in the Texans money line, uh, which means it's all nine games so far this year. I've bet most of those. I did bet this one, not like a, not a ton on it. Cause it is plus two seventy for a reason. And you want to account for a 70% chance the Bengals win this game, but they're the third ring passing offense by number fires metrics so far this year. Their success rate is lower uh, because it's been a lot of deep balls from Stroud and he's been very efficient on those. But like, I, I think that like even, the reason I was okay taking it here is because I know that I aggressively bumped up the Bengals and did still show value on the Texans money line, the money line specifically. I, I don't show value in the spread right now, but the money line specifically I did it's at plus two forty five right now. And I don't think that's a value for me anymore. Uh, but like, I, I believe in this Texans team and I have a high rating on the Bengals, but still can't quite get to this number. So I, I get where you're coming from, Ed, where you just kind of want no part of it and want to just enjoy what should be a pretty fun game. Yeah, it really, it really should be a fun game. For sure. Let's move on to our second game now and talk about the 49ers and the Jaguars. We're right now 49ers are three point favorites. Total in this game is 45 and a half. And Ed, the 49ers falter before their bye week, but we both believe that they'll bounce back. So are you willing to lay the three points with them here in, in a matchup with another very good team in the Jaguars? Right. I mean, I, I think this is really interesting. When I first started thinking about this game, I have Jacksonville three points better than NFL average in my member numbers. And if you really want to make San Francisco minus three in this game, you're essentially saying they're five points better than Jacksonville on a neutral site. That means they're eight points better than, than NFL average. That's a hard thing for me to believe in. I think San Francisco is good. Um, you know, if you only took the first five games of the season, maybe you can make that case, but they've come back to, down to earth, just like Baltimore is going to come back down to earth at some point this season. So are they really eight points better than an NFL average? I think the answer there is no. Then I actually looked at my market numbers and that component of my numbers says Jacksonville is only one point better than NFL average. And the 49ers are six points better than, uh, NFL average by my market model. My market model takes closing point spreads, adjusts for who you played. So, you know, I mean, this is very consistent with what has happened in the markets before that. Um, I mean, I think the I mean, I think the markets are too low on Jacksonville. I, I do think there's a little bit of value. Uh, I mean, this is this is a playoff team in Jacksonville at home, getting three points. Uh, I think that's I, I would definitely lean that way. 
Yeah, with the Jaguars, I was I think with the 49ers, I kind of assumed they'd be good to go. But now on Wednesday, Trent Williams still didn't practice for them. And that's a concern because he's like among the best left tackles in football. And he's going to try to practice Thursday, it sounds like. But it sounds like even if he does play, not at full health just yet. And like, I think that Brock Purdy has been a bit underrated, like recently. Uh, people kind of just taking the recent picks as a reason to dump on him. His yards per attempt has still been very good in this time. Like, he's played overall good quarterback, but he's had these mistakes. But those mistakes are more likely to happen when Trent Williams is not healthy because you get more chaotic stuff happening. And you don't want chaotic stuff with a guy who's not like Lamar Jackson or like a, a guy who is a creator on his own or a Josh Allen, someone like that. So I think that's the the risk here. If you like the 49ers is I'd want to make sure Trent Williams is good to go first because that could put Brock Purdy in a lot of odd situations. And going back to the Jags, Ed, talking about how you thought the market may be a bit too low on them. Like if you look at Lawrence's numbers so far this year, they haven't been impressive, but we also like, like you watch him and you can see that there's room for growth. So I think that what we've seen from the Jags offense so far is kind of, I don't want to say it's their floor, but it's not anywhere near their ceiling. So you talk a lot about teams that have a ceiling that can be improved. And like, I think the Jags kind of fit that, that model to a T because they've got a very good quarterback. Calvin Ridley is not meshed yet with this team, but we know he's a good receiver as well. So I think the upside is higher relative to what they've done so far. Upside is higher at the Jags than the 49ers. Not like not saying their their ceiling is better, but the, there's more room for growth on Jacksonville than in San Francisco, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I mean, I have in terms of pass defense, pass offense, but adjusted success rate. I, I mean, I have Jacksonville in the top ten on both sides of the ball. Probably the offense is more sustainable. You would expect that to be more sustainable with Trevor Lawrence and uh, you know Doug Peterson running that mm-hmm. offense. You'll probably expect to see a little bit more regression on defense, but still, I mean that, that that's why they're so high in my numbers. All righty. Let's talk now about our third game for this week. That is the Browns at the Ravens, where right now Ravens are six and a half point favorites. Total in this game is 38 and a half. And you said last week, Ed, that the Ravens were the top ranked team for you in your 2023 only numbers. And they got another blowout win over a quality team last week. So can the Browns keep this game close enough to cover against what might be the best team in all football? Yeah, we'll see. It's been really interesting to see all the tweets go on about how good Cleveland's defense is. Uh, There's been a lot of chatter out there about when you look at a per drive basis, how elite they are. They're a little bit less elite when you look at success rate uh, on passing plays, uh, but they're still first in the NFL. I mean, I think it's hard to not make this Cleveland defense first and the you know, that's going to keep them in the game no matter what Deshaun Watson does on the other side of the ball um you know i think watson definitely has a high ceiling but you can't really i don't think you can say that he's better than nfl average right now and so we'll see what happens going down the future whether that shoulder gets better whether he starts playing better maybe that all gets uh swamped maybe that maybe we'll never see it get better because they're playing in these you know terrible windy conditions outside as the weather gets colder november december in cleveland Baltimore, you know, I mean, we've talked about all the superlatives of this team. They've clearly been playing great football. They're also clearly going to regress, just like San Francisco has over the last couple of weeks. They can't really keep that up. But, you know, it's interesting to kind of pick holes at Baltimore. You know, their their defense has been better than their offense, which always screams a little bit of regression. But, you know, the defense is still probably a pretty good team. You could kind of pick at, like, well, does Lamar really have elite weapons Zay Flowers is the top target. He is only at 1.6 yards per route run, which is pretty close to the NFL average for wide receiver. Uh, Mark Andrews is at 1.9 yards per route run, which is pretty good for a tight end. I think Mark Andrews is elite. Zay Flowers working on getting there. So I think you can kind of question Lamar's weapons, uh, but they they really have done it. I mean, I have no interest in betting against them, uh, so I will pass on this one. I do show a bit of value on the Ravens money line right now. Uh, that is currently minus 295 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, so the implied odds at uh, minus 295 are 74.68%. I've got them at 767 in large part because I show value in the over in this game. So a bit more room for error when you're betting an over on a 38 and a half point total game. Um, so 
I should value in the over if you want to get exposure to this game, the Ravens money line a bit, but like the spread, I think is about accurate at six and a half, just because like, I mean, in a, in a low scoring game, you should want to take the points um, with the, the Browns, but I just can't have faith in Deshaun Watson against this defense. Like he was bad before the shoulder injury. So why should I expect right. him to suddenly be good now? I think that's my key hang up with them. It's like, I love that defense. Like you were saying, like they're still first even when you adjust for the teams they played, but like, how can you have faith in him being good until he gives you a reason to have that faith? All right. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, would you, I mean, so you probably consider Watson being NFL average kind of a ceiling type right now, short term. Yeah. Yes. Long term. I think it's higher than that, but like, I need, I like, if you're telling me like for the next three weeks, his ceiling at being NFL average, I think that'd be a great outcome for them. Like that'd be a great outcome for them for sure. Yeah, my numbers have Baltimore by five and a half points. So yeah. not seeing a ton of value. And I'm certainly not going against Baltimore. All righty. Let's open things up then, Ed. Where else is seeing value across week number 10 in the NFL? Yeah, let's go back to Will Levis. Uh, I think it is another week to fade Will Levis. Uh, we talked before about how he's chucking the ball deep at an incredible rate. His passing success rate is worse than Zach Wilson. And, um, you know, they face Tampa Bay who uh who's actually remarkably healthy like cornerback jamal dean probably won't play in this game because he's in concussion protocol but their their injury list is is remarkably uh empty for this time of year in in the nfl when you're when you're talking about levis when you're talking about this tennessee team uh I'm, i'm gonna go with my market model based on two games of what they've had when i look at that model it has tampa bay by almost four points I definitely see some value here. I do potentially th- think there are some interceptions coming as well. Some turnovers happening. I, and I just don't think he can continue to chuck the ball deep. Uh, you know, Eric Eager has a new book. And one of the examples that he gives in there is about how passing on deep throws tends to be pretty random. And and I think it's going to be pretty random for Will Levis. Look, this is the same type of thinking that I used to fade Brock Purdy last year and that didn't go well. Will Evans doesn't have as good a team around him either. So I think we're a little bit, even safer, uh, well, more safe fading uh, Levis than we were with Purdy last year. So I, I'll go with Tampa Bay. Um, I sent it out to my members at minus one. Looks like you guys have minus one and a half right now. Uh, I'll take Tampa Bay. Yeah, I've got value in Tampa Bay, too. I have the spread at 3.6. So you said four. I've got 3.6. We're pretty much in lockstep with that one. So the minus one and a half on Tampa Bay is minus 105. Money line minus 116. I also do like the over in this game uh, because Tennessee's defense sucks. Like Kevin Byer, they traded away. They were pretty bad before then, too. Like they've got good pieces along the along the defensive line, but like it doesn't translate to anything. Like their pass defense is hideous, and that might force Tampa Bay to stop running the ball, something they're pretty bad at in general. So I think the Tampa Bay offense should put up points. I think if you like like the Tampa Bay offense, also I'd consider their team total uh, for this game because it's a low total, uh, pretty tight spread. But like Baker's played okay. I don't know like how sustainable that is, but like he is a competent quarterback throwing the ball to Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. So I kind of like, I don't mind having faith in him specifically, whether it be with the total, the spread or the the team total, just because like, it's not like he's the worst quarterback in football. So I think it's fine to have faith in Baker personally. Yeah. I mean, I think Baker is an NFL starter. Yeah. And that's about it. And, oh, and speaking of Carson Wentz got signed. (laughs) Speaking of another conversation we've had over, uh, I don't remember if it was off the air or on this pod, but Carson Wentz got signed and I don't like Carson Wentz, but I, I truly believe he is good enough to be a backup quarterback. And, I mean, uh, Tommy DeVito starting this week, like Carson Wentz is good enough to be a starter. Like a, he's good enough to, to like be on an NFL roster. Like we can say that with zero hesitation. Yeah. I mean, if Sean Clifford gets some snaps with Green Bay, like could he be DeVito like bad? I think he was better in college than DeVito was, right? I'm not sure how that so. all translates. I thought DeVito was like a, like watching him at Syracuse because he was there when we lived there. Like mm-hmm. I thought he was like a tough guy who like couldn't throw – like he could throw bombs and occasionally hit, but like it seemed like he was more of like a guy who wanted to run. I'm like, I, that's not an NFL quarterback. And like 
is it bad that I'm hoping Matt Barkley plays for that team? Like that's where we're at. Where I'm hoping for Matt Barkley, so I can get my Saquon Barkley dynasty shares to be okay. Like that's the the bottom we've reached here already. I think it's interesting because you know I I think NFL coaches do some weird stuff in general. Mm-hmm. You know, talk about the analytics and the fourth down. But in general, like they're pretty good at evaluating who can play football. Yeah. And somehow Tommy DeVito made it. I mean, I guess he was the third stringer, which yeah. may be less befuddling than Sean Clifford being the backup in Green Bay, if you think about that, right? But sure. I don't know. I mean, he he I mean he must have played well enough in camp to to make that roster. I mean, Clifford's the backup behind a guy who had never started more than one game. So like that's 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 pretty wild. Like they had to Rod Taylor. They had a guy in Daniel Jones who was flawed, but like signed a big contract. So like, I think the Clifford one is more confusing. Yeah. Well, we'll see if he gets on the field. Yeah. Green. I know the stuff has been tough for Jordan love, but Packers fans better hope that doesn't happen. Um, right. That's, right. Exactly. That's what I would say. Also, while we're talking about love, I did want to say like, you made me think of this right now. Like, I think the way this year has played out has made the Jordan Love extension look really, really good. Like what they did was they had the fifth year option on the table for him this year. And as opposed to picking up the fifth year option, which would have been like 20 something million for his fifth year, they signed into a one year extension where he's on like an $8 million deal next year. So like (laughs) the fact that he's not playing well doesn't matter. And so like, I know that like the fact they went with love, like it didn't work out, but like, I kind of respect their front office more now for the way they work that contract. So it's a very weird situation, but I, I I've weirdly gained respect for them this year. So shout out to them for a, a unique contract with Jordan love. But I feel like you'd have more respect if they had a veteran behind them though. Right. Probably like a Carson. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. So we can dump on them for the Clifford thing justified and respect the, the contract lack of extension uh, for Jordan love. But yeah, the, the, the back of quarterback thing is, is very, very fair. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread as mentioned the Sunday night football preview of the Jets and the Raiders with Tom Vecchio uh, talking some player props for that game that'll be up on the covering the spread podcast feed later on today player prop show with JJ Zacharyson coming up tomorrow all right here on the covering the spread podcast feed the regular shows on FanDuel TV plus and the FanDuel YouTube page as well Ed what you got going on this week over at the power rank. Yeah, check out my uh, free sports betting email newsletter every Saturday. I come out with Five Nuggets Saturday, which is my curated list of sports betting tips and analytics. If you're looking for action on any given weekend, uh, that's really the free service for you. Uh, usually 51 out of fi- I think 51 out of 52 of the last weeks. Um, so check that out at thepowerrank.com. Also, I think I mentioned yesterday that I had Kevin Cole on the Football Analytics Show. Uh, great show, lots of insights on various different nfl teams kevin someone who definitely knows the analytics and is also willing to go back and and watch all the plays as well so check that out wherever you get your podcast the football analytics show all right and again the newsletter is at the powerrank.com find ed on twitter at the power rank i'm on twitter at jim sonis you can also find me on threads at jim.sonis you can follow fanduel research on twitter at fanduel research want to thank you all for tuning in for today good luck to you if you're betting on thursday night football we'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down some player props for week 10 this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network 